Well, it's great to be with you this morning. Please be seated. Um, one thing that we forgot to mention to you, uh, you know, we're all about knowing the truth, being obedient to the truth of God's Word. There's an opportunity to be obedient uh, in baptism. If you are here this morning and you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and haven't yet made that public in a public statement through water baptism, we're going to have baptism next Sunday after the second service, and we would encourage you uh, to take that step of faith. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, it always is. So uh, I'll be preaching a message on baptism and showing from God's Word why it is just so important. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is this. It was, uh, it was a great day at the stadium. Hey, my, my, my victory socks are on. And uh, we had a great, great team went out there, and uh, you guys are just going to have to put up with me this season. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm wearing those socks about a dozen times. So um, before we get into God's Word, I want to um, have you men take a look at this. Watch this. Amen. You know, in uh, God's Word in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, it says this, Be on the alert stand firm in the faith, act like men, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. About 10 years ago, we did the best thing we've ever done here in terms of a Bible study for men. We did men's fraternity. It has now been updated, kind of repackaged, uh, men's fraternity 33, and uh, I am so excited about this opportunity for the men of Mariner's Church to learn what it means to act like a man. And I'm going to encourage all you guys to sign up today as you leave. Uh, the first session is going to be a six-week session. starts at 6 o'clock here on Friday morning. Uh, don't miss it. It's going to be a great opportunity. Would you bow with me as we uh, consider God's Word this morning? <clears throat> Father... Thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Word of God. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would instruct us this morning on this last piece of the Christian's arsenal, uh, the sword of the Spirit, uh, which is the Word of God. Lord, would you speak to each one of us uniquely? We're all at a different place on our spiritual journey. And we would just ask that, that every single one of us would be encouraged to take uh, another step uh, toward you. And Lord, we'll be careful for what you do and how you are glorified through that uh, and to give you praise. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, <clears throat> we're going to finish off this series on the armor of God, and we'll be looking at the, the last piece of equipment that we've been given in spiritual warfare uh, Ephesians 6.17, which says to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. A man named Guthrie has once said this of the Word of God. He said, the Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of inexhaustible wealth, a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a medicine for every malady, a balm for every wound, rob us of our Bible, and the sky has lost its sun. What a tremendous statement on the sufficiency of the Scripture. The, the Bible, the Bible that, that I hope you are holding in your lap is the greatest resource that we have in spiritual warfare. Uh, I want to point out to you this morning, uh, as we get into this study, uh, eight claims that the Bible makes for itself. Uh, I picked these up from John MacArthur's study of uh, the book of Ephesians, and uh, you want to just write these down as I give them to you. Here they come. The Bible claims that it is infallible, that uh, it is without error in total. The sum of all of its parts makes no mistake. Psalm 119, 160 says, the, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. It is faultless, flawless, without blemish. The law of the Lord is perfect. And what, what I think that is saying here is that every affirmation that is made in the Bible is true, and it is right. 
The Bible is infallible. Secondly, it is inerrant. That means that there's no error in any of its parts, right down to the very words of Scripture. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. Psalm 12, verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver is tried in a furnace on earth refined seven times. Every, every word is pure truth, and even down to the letter. Uh, in Matthew 5, 18, Jesus said, For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth has passed away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from this law until it's all accomplished. The, 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 not only the concepts of the Bible right, but every single word and letter in the original manuscripts is right and true. Number three, it is complete. It is, it is a finished work, the Bible. You, you can't add to it. You can't take away from it. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, John writes, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book or this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life. What, what this is saying is the Bible's finished, folks. It's done. Genesis to Revelation. After John finished writing Revelation, the book was closed. And so what, that, this is what this means. Whatever the Koran is saying, whatever the Book of Mormon is saying, whatever some other book claiming to be from God is saying, it is not from God. The, the Bible alone is from God, and it is a finished work. Number four, it is authoritative. That means when, when God speaks out of this book, everybody ought to listen. Everybody better listen. In Isaiah 1, verse 2, the scripture says, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. And those who refuse to listen to the Lord speaking do so to their own detriment. Uh, look, look at this verse, Proverbs 13, 13. The one who despises the word will be in debt to it, but the one who fears the commandment will be blessed. It was about 25 years ago uh, that a woman who was a member of a previous congregation that I pastored uh, was living in sin, committing adultery with, with the man they were living together, and so out of love for her and out of the knowledge of the inevitable pain that lies in the path of those who are committing sexual sin, uh, we went to her and confronted her with God's word. At that point, she refused to listen. Uh, we had to go through all the steps of church discipline, and eventually this woman left our church. Um, it was, I didn't hear from her for about 12 years, and I received a letter from this woman, and here's what she wrote to me. She said, Bill, I heard you on WRBS this morning. I was being interviewed about something. I can't even remember what it was, and I had to write to you. I figured you were in the Annapolis area, but didn't know where you went after Fellowship Chapel, this previous church that I had pastored. You may remember me, and she gave her name, and she said, we met the night that my husband Roy was killed. I was called over, another story, over to her house. Her husband had been shot and killed, led her to the Lord. She was baptized in, her church, in the church. And she says, uh, my son and I were baptized months later after this incident. I subsequently went through rocky times with a live-in partner, which you counseled me on numerous times, and you were right, of course. I prayed and prayed that God would change the situation because I was helpless, and he did. The man just walked away, and, and it was devastating to me. But I knew it was an answer to prayer. And then she goes on to tell how her life had been restored, how she repented of her sin. She eventually married a Christian man, and God just richly blessed her life. Her two sons you know, ultimately had come to know the Lord. Her daughter, years later, had come to know Jesus. Her life was a living illustration of Proverbs 13:13, 13, 13, which says, "The one who despises the word will be in debt to it. When you disobey, you pay. You have a heavy price to pay." Uh, what was the result of her sin? She said, "I was devastated." And did you hear what she said in the letter? She said, "Bill, you were right. But folks, I wasn't right. 
God was right. His word is always right. And, and the Bible says that when you sin, you suffer. You, you are free to make your choices, but we are not free from the consequences of those choices, and the Bible warns us. But the Bible also says that when you repent, the one who fears the commandment will be blessed, will be rewarded. And her life was richly blessed after she repented and came back to the Lord Jesus. And she closed with this. She said, just wanted you to know your words, your conviction, the message never returns void. The Bible is the last word. What it says is going to happen, folks. Here's, here's the next one. The Bible is, it is sufficient. That means that the Bible gives you everything that you need to live this life. We don't need some new discovery in psychology or psychiatry. The Bible is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 15 says, the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. This book is all you need to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It goes on to say in uh, 2 Timothy 3.17 that all scriptures inspired by God, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This Bible tells us how to, we're to live a good life, to do good things. The next one, I think this is number six. It is, the Bible is effective. When the Bible speaks, things happen. The Word of God works transformation. The Word of God is being spoken here this morning, folks. God is speaking through His Word this morning. And Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be, which goes forth from my mouth, God's mouth. It shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I, uh, accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which it is sent. God's going to do something through His Word this morning. It's going to accomplish something in the hearts and lives of men and women. And then the seventh thing is that it is, God's word is divine. But know this first of all, 2 Peter 1.20, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Nobody ever sat down one day and said, I'm going to write holy scripture. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. This book was written by God, by the Holy Spirit of God. It is a divine book, the only book on the planet that can have that claim. And then the final thing is that the, the Bible is determinative. And here's what I mean by that. What a person does with the Bible reveals their relationship to God. And in John 8, 47, Jesus said, He who is of God hears the words of God. The person who's of God hears and obeys the words of God. And, and then it says this, For this reason, Jesus is probably talking to the Pharisees here, you do not hear them, you do not obey them, and here's why, because you are not of God. The word of God is determinative. Those who listen and obey the word of God, it shows that they are of God. Those who do not are not of God. Eight claims that the Bible makes for itself. Let me show you something before we move into the discussion of the sword of the spirit that I think is very helpful in understanding spiritual warfare uh, this week, I, I considered the thoughts that prompted Paul to write about this arsenal of spiritual weapons that we've been given to do battle with Satan. And it's interesting, as you look at chapter 4, you know, chapter 6 is where the armor of God is. In chapter 4, it is written about the Christian and his relationships in the church. In chapter 5, it speaks of the relationship and the responsibilities of the Christian in marriage. And then when you get to chapter 6, he, he considers the relationships and responsibilities in the family, the parent-child relationship. And then he moves on to the relationship in the workplace between employers and employees. So, so in the writing concerning the spiritual battle occurs as a result of the discussion of life's most basic relationships. Where, folks, where are the arenas of conflict going to be for us? They're going to be in the home. They're going to be at church. They're going to be at work. 
that's where we can expect the battle. Our greatest, write this down, place of conflict will be in life's most basic relationships. And that's why I love Ephesians 6, verse 12. So often we get it wrong, folks. We think the enemy is that woman I'm living with or that man I'm living with. We think that the enemy is, is you know, our boss at work, some lazy employee. But no. Look at Ephesians 6, 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not people, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. It's talking about demons here against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Folks, our struggle is against Satan and his highly organized army of demons who are working in and through the daily routine circumstances and relationships of life. Planting thoughts in our minds where the real battle is. And what, it, what he does is he uses the actions, he uses the attitudes, he uses the words of other people around us to plant thoughts in our mind that are deceptive and wrong and meant to destroy. And his ultimate goal is to take us out of the fight, to, to keep us from our mission, which is establishing his kingdom on planet Earth. However, for the purpose of this warfare, we have been adequately uh, sufficiently equipped with the full armor of God, a spiritual suit of armor, all six pieces, that are, is absolutely devastating to the devil and his demons if any run-of-the-mill child of God will just put it on. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God. And folks, you better do it every day. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You'll be able to if you put it on. That's what he's saying. And I think uh, as we look today at this last piece, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, of all the equipment uh, needed for victory, in the midst and the heat of the battle, in the middle of the fray, the sword is the, is the most important uh, there were two different kinds of swords that Roman soldiers used, two main models. Uh, the first was a, was a broad sword. It was the Greek word is romphia. It was a, a large sword that was, was grabbed by two, as a two-fisted sword. And in battle, they would swing this thing and they would aim for the head. That's why you have to wear the helmet of salvation. It was, it was just a broad, big, sweeping sword, romphia. And then, uh, that's not the Greek word that's used in verse 17. There's another word called makaira, uh, which is, speaks of a different kind of sword. And this was a, the normal sword that was carried by every soldier. Uh, it could be anything from a six-inch dagger to an 18-inch uh, sword put into a sheath, a scabbard uh, by the side of the soldier. And it was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat, close-in fighting. Uh, the Makaira was a model sword that was designed to be precise in its attack. It was for close hand-to-hand -hand combat, designed to deal with the pointed attacks of the devil. The devil usually does not attack with some general thing. It is with a specific thought or a specific deception, and we need to be able to answer that with a specific thrust of the sword. Now, let, let me show you four aspects of this sword of the Spirit. First, its maker. Who is the maker of the sword? Ephesians 6, 17, and take up the sword of the Spirit. That, that expression, sword of the Spirit, in the Greek is a genitive of origin. I hope you're impressed with that. Uh, but it simply means where the sword has come from. The sword comes from from it's of the spirit it comes from the spirit of god the holy spirit is the one who forges the metal he's the constructor of this sword john macarthur indicates that when anyone becomes a christian he receives the sword of the spirit there's a sense in which when the holy spirit takes up residence in your life he 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 becomes the sword of the spirit because he is the one who teaches us what the word of god means you see a, an unbeliever can can have a bible but an unbeliever cannot understand the bible i mean there are brilliant men who do not understand the bible 
And we know this because 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually appraised, they are spiritually discerned, and, and their foolishness to the one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is the Spirit of God living in the life of the believer that, that makes the Word of God available to us. Look at John 14, 26. Jesus said this, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, He's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. In 1 John 2, 27, uh, it says, And as for you, believers, the anointing, speaking of the Holy Spirit, which you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as His anointing, as the Holy Spirit teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie. In a, in a real sense, folks, when a person comes to Christ, he receives into his heart the Holy Spirit, the resident truth teacher, and he receives the sword of the Spirit. The, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that gives you the power to understand the Bible. For 23 years, I read the Bible, I couldn't get it. I didn't understand it. You know, if, if, if it was nighttime and we turned off every light in this room and I tried to read the Bible, I couldn't read it. But if we flip the switch and turn the lights on, you know, it becomes understandable. I see the words and I see what it means and what it says. Now, here's, here's what flips the switch in Bible study. When I have a willingness to do what the Bible says, that is when the Bible becomes understanding. The Holy Spirit will then make it clear to me. And let me show you where I got that. In John 17, 17, here's what Jesus said. He said, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know the teaching that, that it is of God. He will understand. If you are willing to do the will of God, that's when understanding comes. And when I determine to do what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit teaches me, and, and watch this, here's why I'm saying all this, what the Holy Spirit teaches me becomes the sword of the Spirit in my life. Write this down, folks. The sword of the Spirit in your life or my life is that specific body of truth in the Word of God that you understand, that you believe, and you obey. Let me talk about its material, the material of this sword. What material does God use to construct the sword in our lives? Take up the sword of the Spirit, verse 17, which is the Word of God. To grasp the significance of, of this text, we, we have to understand this term, Word of God. Circle, circle that, the word, Word, there. It, it is not the Greek word logos, which is a term referring to a broad and general word. The, the expression used here is the Greek word rhema, which, which refers to a specific statement, a specific utterance. We're, we're looking at the, at the difference, folks, up here, the difference between a book, logos, and a sentence, rhema. The sword of the Spirit refers to the specific statements of God. And here's the point. We need to know the specific statements of God in order to deal with the temptations and the attacks of Satan. That is why this sword is the Machaira. It is specific. It is pointed. It is small. It is for hand-to-hand -hand combat. We, we need to go beyond our understanding of the, the broad truths of Scripture. We know God's plan is thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But how does that translate into my family? What is God's will in terms of my relationship with my wife and her relationship to me? What, what is God's will or his principles in terms of parent-child relationship in the workplace and so forth? We need to know the specific truths of God and be specific in those areas. So what is the sword of the Spirit which is at your disposal in spiritual warfare? It, it is this, it is the specific truths of God that you know, that you understand, that you believe and you are committed to obey. It is your particular 
grasp of the principles of Scripture? What is your knowledge of the Word of God, the specifics of the Word of God? And I'll say this, folks, the less you know of the specific content of the Word of God, the more vulnerable you are going to be in the spiritual battle with the enemy. And here's the, here's the big point that I'm making to, to us as believers this morning. What, what is the condition of your sword? I mean, so, some believers have swords, but they are dull. They, they have not been sharpened uh, in their thinking with dedicated study of the Word of God. And, and the point is this, the Spirit of God, mark it down, cannot use what has not been put there through diligent study. So, what is this sword capable of doing? Let's look at its magnificence. The sword of the Spirit is magnificent in its power. I'll tell you, this sword, has, I've already alluded to it, has the power to save. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul encouraged Timothy to be diligent in the study of the Word. He says this to him, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. He was taught God's Word by his mom and his grandmother, but it was ultimately the Holy Spirit who was teaching him, and that from childhood, it says, you have known the sacred writings, which are able, which have the power to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through Jesus Christ. This book has the power to save a man or a woman from hell for heaven. It's the only book that has that power. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, what is written in this book, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The sword of the Spirit has the power to save, but watch this, it also has the power to sharpen. And by that I mean the Word of God can sharpen our discernment. It is, it is powerful in the judgment that it gives. Look at Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and this book is able to judge the thoughts and intents of our heart this this is speaking of the discernment of judgment it is it is the power of the word of god that can slice a man open reveal what the true motives of his heart are it folks it is the power this word is like a mirror and you can look into it as the power of this word that can show you whether or not you're truly saved and truly in the kingdom of God, you want to know where you are spiritually, you want to know the true motives of your heart, this thing will open you up and show you that. And not only will it show you and discern your spiritual condition, it will, it will give you sharpness and discernment. Look at Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. It says, Everyone who partakes only of milk, analogy for the word is food, is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Did you hear what that just said? The Word of God is able to sharpen your senses to discern what is good and what is evil. Folks, uh, we're in trouble in this society. We, we no longer know what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. We are living in a day of Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We, we are living in a culture, a society that, is, that, that just can't tell what's right and what's wrong. There, there's there's no, no discernment. That's why, why the first spiritual discipline that we encourage here at Mariner's Church is to read faithfully the Word of God. Why? Because it has the power to, to, to sharpen your senses to discern good and evil. And when you walk out there on Monday morning, you better know where the good is and what the evil is. You better follow the good and avoid the evil. Look now at the ministry of the Word in spiritual warfare. As believers, we've all experienced the power of the sword to deliver from sin's penalty. It has the power to save us. However, in our daily battle 
Uh, there are two primary uses for the sword. Uh, we, can, we can use this sword in our own lives and in the lives of others. Write this down, folks. The, here's the devil's program. The devil deceives us to destroy us by getting us to disobey God's word. The, the Lord has given us this sword of the Spirit primarily to deal with disobedience, disobedience to God's word. That, that is the ministry of the sword of the Spirit to free us from disobedience. Let, let me share with you the very first time I experienced the ministry of the sword of the Spirit in my life releasing me from disobedience. Did you ever realize that any man, woman, boy, or girl, who does not believe in Jesus is disobedient to God? You say, where'd you get that? Well, I got it from God's Word. Uh, if you don't believe in Jesus, you are disobedient to God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. This is His commandment. It's a commandment to obey or disobey. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. I, folks, for 23 years of my life, I was disobedient. I did not believe in the name of Jesus Christ, that he was Savior, that he was Lord. I did not receive him as Savior. I did not obey him as Lord. I did not love him. I didn't really love others. I loved myself. And I was bound by cords of deception that, that entirely left God out of my life. I was disobedient. And I, I've had this kind of vision of what my condition was like before, uh, you know, up to my 23rd year. And like so many in the world today, and I, I just imagined the devil as this huge dragon that was holding on to me through ropes and chains. And, and the devil tempts and deceives and holds men captive. He held me captive with ropes and chains of deceptive lies, all the while pulling, pulling me, dragging me closer and closer to the abyss of an eternal separation from God. That was my condition. I was bound by lies. You say, well, Bill, what what kind of what kind of lies are you talking about? You know that 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 you know he binds people with. I can only tell you what was going on in my life. It was this thought that hey, you don't need God. God's not really good. Uh, it's it's Bill. It's your life. It is your life. You be the boss. If you don't be the boss, you're going to miss out on all the fun. That's what I believe. That that was a, that was a chain that chained me to the enemy. Uh, I don't want anybody telling me what to do, how to live my life. I know better than anybody what's best for me. And hey, Bill, you're not a bad person. I mean, look at that guy over there. <laughs> you're not as bad as he, I'm not pointing to anybody here, that guy over there. You're not as bad as that guy. Who needs forgiveness? Who needs Jesus? I have my rights. And with such thoughts, I was, I was held captive by the enemy. He holds men in bondage to deception, dragging them toward eternity to share his ultimate fate of destruction and death. He is the leader in disobedience. And I've got to tell you, for 23 years, I was being dragged along, and I thought I was right the whole time. I thought I was, I thought I was living. I thought I had found the truth. And you know what Proverbs 14, 12, it says it twice in the, in the word. And Proverbs 16, 25 says, it says, there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So that's where I was. But then one day, uh, a man began to speak to me specific rhema statements from the Word of God. Statements of truth concerning who God is. Statements concerning my true condition before God, a sinner before God deserving of judgment. I began to see 
from rhema statements from the Word of God that I was guilty. I saw people that I had hurt with my sin. I saw that I had offended a holy God. But then he spoke statements, rhema statements, facts that like God sent his son to, to be like me in every way except with, with sin. He, he didn't sin. He, he came to set me free from judgment. I heard statements concerning how much God loved me. And, and I will never forget how, you know, just listening to the, this, these messages, these rhema statements from the Word of God were, were just hacking this. He was using the sword and just hacking those cords of deception that were holding me, being dragged along. And then at some moment, speaking about the love of Jesus Christ, finally he whacked a final blow with a rhema statement. And, and I broke free. I was set free. I was no longer going this way. I was going this way to the cross. And, and I, I'm telling you, it was like I walked out of darkness into the light. It was as though my heart began to beat for the first time. But in my freedom... I found that I was immediately bound in bondage to another. My la life became bound in obedience to the one who loved me so much that, that he died to set me free. And I was released from a life of disobedience to the word of God. And the moment I bowed my knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ, I became bound in obedience to him. I'm telling you folks, the, this sword has the power to save, to set men and women free from destruction and disobedience. It did me. And once we're saved, you think, well, maybe the devil's just done. You know, he's not done. He will not leave us alone once we're saved. He can never cause us to be lost again, but he doesn't want us to be effective as that man was in my life who was speaking the word of God to me, setting me free from disobedience. Satan does not want us to give glory to God by being transformed and becoming like Jesus and being used by God to bring others to Jesus Christ. Though I'm free from his doom and judgment, uh, Satan's going to continue to drag us, deceive us into disobedience. And this is, this is the battle that we Christians face every day, the deceptive power of sin. And in this battle, I need a sharp sword. And if your sword is dull or if your sword is in its sheath, uh, you'll be no match as a Christian for the deceptions of the enemy. You will lack the discernment. And there's only one means of release in the daily battle. It's through a sharp sword. You must know what the Bible says. Uh, listen to this. L listen to Jesus. Uh, listen to what it says about Jesus. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, Jesus was tempted... In all things like we are, yet without sin. That's saying that Jesus never disobeyed. Under the full onslaught of all of Satan's temptations, his entire bag of tricks, Satan, uh, I mean, Jesus faced the most intense temptation in the wilderness when the devil pulled out everything. And what did Jesus do? What, how did he fight the enemy? The answer is he went to his sword. He went to his sharp sword. In Matthew 4, 11 through 12, Satan tempted Jesus with three distinct temptations, power, pleasure, pride. They were all temptations to disobedience. And in each case, Jesus pulled out his sword and write this down. Jesus' answer to the devil's temptation is this. It is written. And he came out with a specific statement in the word of God that showed the, the folly and the destruction of Satan's temptation. Listen, the key to, to Jesus' victory over temptation was a sharp sword. Jesus knew the Word of God. You say, well, Bill, come on. Of course he did. He was God. Listen, you got to understand this about Jesus. When he humbled himself to become a man, he lived and walked and talked in this man as an earth. He submitted himself to the human laws of maturity. Luke tells us that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus had to learn the specific rhema statements of God as a man. And he learned the word of God more than any man, of course. 
Uh, his sword was sharper than any man's sword. He craved to know the Father's will. That's why when he was a 12-year-old boy, he said, didn't you know that I had to be about my Father's business? What was he doing in that, speaking with the, those scribes? He was learning the specific statements of the Word of God. We, all that to say, we must also have a sword that is sharpened to be ready in the battle. And I think, I think the key for us having a sharp sword, look at Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. We see this in Jesus' life. It says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition. Pray at all times in the Spirit. Let me, let me tell you the key to having your sword sharpened in your life. It is through daily prayerful study of the Word of God. It is, it is praying, God, I can't understand this book without you. God, I need you to t- open my eyes to see and to understand the principles of this life. Lord, and then I can't follow them apart from the power of your Holy Spirit. I need your Spirit to understand these things and to obey these things. It is through prayerful study of the Word of God that the sword gets sharp. And we need it. We're going to close in prayer in just a moment. And I'm just thinking of, you know, how can we apply this message, each one of us, to our hearts this morning? And in fact, I'm going to ask you right now, would you just please, everyone, bow in prayer, heads bowed, eyes closed? Perhaps as we've considered the sword's ministry to provide release from disobedience, there's been maybe some disobedience in your life that has been brought to light. Maybe through some rhema statement, you become aware of some deception, some disobedience in your life. Maybe you've heard the slashes of the sword of the Spirit hacking away at the cords that have tied your heart to sin. And and maybe today is your day to break free. Maybe you've been excusing sin in your life through deceptive rationalization. Maybe, Maybe somebody here is struggling with the sin of bitterness unforgiveness of someone who's hurt you in the past. Maybe, maybe the sin of envy, greed, materialism, loving money more than God. Maybe it's the sin of drunkenness or some addiction. Perhaps uh, the sin of disobedience to parents. Maybe it's lying or deceit. Perhaps immorality, sex outside of marriage, the the sin of pornography. Let, listen, let today be the day that the Spirit sets you free through repentance by changing your mind and your heart toward the sin today. Stop desp- Anyone who despises the Word, who doesn't obey the Word, will be in debt to it, will pay a price. Let this be the day that you break free. Obey the command. Receive the reward. And perhaps today is the day that Maybe someone in here breaks free from the ultimate sin, the only sin that will send a man to hell, and that is the refusal to bow and believe in Jesus Christ, receive Him as Lord and Savior. It is this deception that you don't need a Savior, that you are good enough, you are not. It is this deception that life is all about you, life is under your control, you are not in control. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do with your life. It's your life. That is the ultimate deception. It is not your life. God gave it to you to live for His glory. And maybe today you're you're seeing that the Spirit of God is hacking with the sword, the cords of deception, maybe the final cord. And maybe today you're ready to say, Lord Jesus, I repent. I need you. I need what you did on the cross for me. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me take my life oh father thank you for the power of this incredible sword of the word of god the power to save and to sharpen the power of deliverance and discernment and i want to pray for the person here who's never obeyed you through repentance and faith in jesus received you as savior and lord that that you would release them father and set them free unto eternal life And Lord, that they might even be willing to make the public declaration through through baptism, water baptism, that you have set them free. Lord, I pray for the person here, the believer who's struggling with one of those sin areas. Lord, please set them free today. And Lord, I pray for all of us that we would recommit to sharpen our swords 
so that we can overcome the enemy as he tries to destroy our marriages, our families, our jobs. Lord, would you just make us sharp for your glory? We pray in Jesus' name.